In this video, we're going to look at the basic graph of the sine function. This is the most basic form that the sine function can have. And so in equation form, we would typically write y equals the sine of x. Or if you want to emphasize that you're dealing with a function, and it is a function, and I'll prove that to you a little bit later, you could see it written as f of x equals the sine of x. So hopefully you remember from um, previous algebra coursework that y and f of x represent the same variable. Now I didn't want to confuse you just by diving right into it. I want to hopefully let you see where the values come from. Our input here, which is the x, is going to be one of the angle measures from the unit circle. And typically we'll do this in radians um, as opposed to degrees because we are dealing with um, the unit circle. And also it's a little bit easier to deal with radians as you progress into upper level mathematics courses such as calculus and differential equations. And so it's a little bit easier to use radians. Okay, so our input is the angle measure. Our output is going to be the sine of that angle. Now remember, the sine of the angle actually corresponds to the y coordinate of the ordered pair. And this circle may be a little small for you to see, so you may want to have one handy um, to look at. So if I want to find, and I'll do a couple of them up here in this area, if I want to find the sine of 0. Then I'm going to go to the zero measure on the unit circle, and the y value at that point is zero. So the sine of zero is zero. Then if I want to look at the sine of pi sixth, okay, I'm going to read around to pi sixth. Again, I'm looking for the y coordinate, which happens to be one half. Okay. Then again, you continue that rotation. Pi force would be square root 2 over 2. The sine of pi thirds would be square root 3 over 2. The sine of pi halves, which is our quadrantial angle, again, looking at it, you have the y coordinate is 1. And you'll notice that that's the maximum value that we can have because, again, think about it. We're on a unit circle where the radius is 1. So the highest value I'm going to have is a value of 1. Again, continuing the rotation, I have a sine of 2 pi thirds. I'm now in the second quadrant. The sine would be the square root of 3 over 2. The sine of 3 pi fourths is square root 2 over 2. The sine of uh, 5 pi sixth would be positive 1 half. And then we get to the sine of pi, and at pi, the sine value is again zero. Okay, so we have a zero or an x intercept at zero that also happens to be the y intercept. And then I have another zero or x intercept at pi. I'm going to continue the revolution. Okay, so now I'm down to 7 pi sixth. I'm in the third quadrant. And my sine, which is the y coordinate, is negative one half. For sine of five pi fourths, I have negative square root two over two. I'm reading these directly off of the unit circle. Four pi thirds, the sine or the y value is negative square root three over two. Let me emphasize that that's a negative. Square root. Or excuse me, 3 pi over 2, so the sine 
of 3 pi over 2 would be negative 1. And you'll notice that that's the lowest value or the minimum. Okay, again, because think about it, we're on that unit circle. We're only going to be running from negative 1 to positive 1. Okay, so that's our maximum. And we keep rotating. 5 pi thirds, we're in quadrant 4. We have negative square root 3 over 2. 7 pi fourths, we have uh, negative square root 2 over 2. Pi 11 pi 6, the sign of 11 pi 6 would be negative 1 half. And then remember 2 pi is really the same thing as 0 because I've made my way all the way back around. So again, at that point, I have a 0. So the sign of 2 pi is also 0. So that gives us a third 0. And I pointed out those points where you have zeros and the maximum and the minimum because those are typically the points that we focus on at least initially when we're trying to create the graph of the sine curve. So I did make you a note about that. As you get ready to graph the sine function or really any function, you want to focus on your key points. And typically those key points are going to be your y-intercept your zeros, which are also known as your x-intercepts, your minimum values, and your maximum values. And for the sine function, those particular values typically occur at your quadrantial angle values. Okay, and so then we can take and look at this graph on the coordinate grid. Okay, so I'm going to manually draw this graph. This is how you would do it if you were doing it by hand. Okay, so you want to draw your coordinate grid system. Okay, so I'm going to draw straight a line as possible. That vertical line represents my y-axis. Then I'm going to have a horizontal line, which represents my x-axis. Now, vertically on the y-axis, I really only have to have a value for 1, and negative 1 in this scenario because we're still talking about it in terms of the unit circle. Okay, typically on the horizontal axis you'll have really about five key points. You have your beginning point, then you have your first quadrantial angle which occurs at pi halves. You have the second quadrantial angle which occurs at pi the third quadrantial angle, which occurs at 3 pi halves, and then you have the last one, which gets you back to 0 or 2 pi. Now, I rotated. I did it, I did it to the right in positive, but we can also rotate in a negative direction, and I could go to negative pi halves, negative pi, negative 3 pi halves, or to negative 2 pi. Okay, so we can rotate positively or negatively. And so if we go back to our table of values, we know that when x was 0, y is 0. So at the origin, I'm going to have, whoops, an ordered pair. I have the ordered pair 0, 0. Okay, so I'm going to put that on the origin. Then at pi halves, again I'm looking primarily at my quadrantial angles. At pi halves, when x is pi halves, my y value is 1. Okay, so at pi halves I have a value, whoops, let me get that, of 1. Okay, so I have pi halves, comma, 1. Then when I get back to pi, I believe the value is 0. We can go back and look. At 3 pi halves, it was negative 1. So that gives me the value 3 pi over 2, comma, negative 1. And then at 2 pi, I was back at 
zero. Okay, and you can get those off of the table that we created. Now, if I rotated, so when I graph this, I connect the dots with a smooth rounded curve, I'm going to have comes up to the peak at one, it comes back down. Okay, and so if you notice, there's kind of a pattern here. You basically have a zero, a maximum, a zero, a minimum, a zero. Zero, maximum, zero, minimum, zero. So if we think about it, if we wanted to rotate negatively and you follow that pattern, now remember we're working backwards, so we're going to have zero, minimum, zero, maximum, zero. So I could draw the sine curve again. I'm a little bit off. Sorry about that. Okay, and so this actually gives you two full pictures of the sine curve. And we talk about the period. And the period is how long does it take you to see the whole picture. And in this case, the whole picture would be you have to have one curve above the x-axis, one curve below the x-axis. So our period for the sine curve is 2 pi. We have to basically do one full, one full revolution around the unit circle in order to get the full picture of the sine curve in its most basic format. Now, so, but we know that from previous algebra lessons that we can take a graph and we can reflect it, we can stretch it horizontally, we can stretch it vertically, um, we can change um, its height um, by using a vertical or we can shift it left or right, up or down. And so we can do the same thing with the sine curve, but the first thing you need to get familiar with before we begin looking at all of those transformations is you need to know and understand what the basic shape of the sine curve is. The basic shape begins at zero, ends at zero, mids at zero, max is at one, mins at negative one, and it goes up, down, and back up again, similar to a roller coaster. Some of the characteristics of the sine curve, it is a function because if you look at it, it would pass the vertical line test. Okay, so it is a function. The domain for the sine curve is basically any number you can think of or any angle that you can think of. The range is from negative 1 to positive 1, and that is related to the fact that we're dealing with the unit circle. Okay, and the unit circle has a radius of 1, so that's the maximum that we would have on our sine curve. It is periodic, which I tried to show you, okay, because the pattern repeats itself, and the pattern repeats after 2 pi. It starts over again. You may not remember from algebra, but the sine function is odd because it is symmetric about the origin. Okay, it is symmetric about the origin. You have zeros that occur basically at 0, pi, and 2 pi. So pattern-wise, basically your zeros occur every pi units. Your relative minimums occur at 3 pi halves every revolution. And the relative maximums occur at pi halves, again, every revolution. And your y-intercept is 0, 0. And one of the applications of the sine curve is sound waves, which you need for listening to music, creating music, radio, TV, any kind of sound wave. And even just looking at these pictures, hopefully you can tell that for some of these, you have um, different changes. They're, they're closer together or they're, they're kind of like to what we would think about being taller um, curves and that kind of thing. And so that's where we have to get into this idea that we can transform the curve, how we can stretch it 
or shrink it or shift it up or down. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But at this point, what you need to be most familiar with is to learn this pattern for the sine curve. This blue curve that starts at zero, ends at zero, is midway is at zero, maxes at one, maxes at negative one. And that is the sine function.